Hey, Greg, is that your way of trying to get off the hook in case of I course. say something crazy? Any, any <laughs> way I can get off the hook, that's, that's my MO. It's in the back. So, Christopher, <laughs> can you hear me? I, you, there you are. Yeah, tell us about how you met Jonathan. Tell us how, about how you met um, Chris back yeah, in 2013. Yeah. 2013. Well, 2013. Like so, Chris and I, um, we met at a Transform World gathering in IHOP KC. And, um, you know, it was uh, in this season where um, some doors were starting to open um, at uh, the Northfield campus, in Northfield, Massachusetts. And, um, you know, God was beginning to kind of draw that back into my focus, our focus, our team here in Western Massachusetts. And Chris, you know, so we're kind of this little, um, you know, very little group. And Chris, I meet Chris, and Chris is leading this um, large organization established, the U.S. Center for World Missions. And I'm kind of thinking, and then we have these like great conversations. I'm kind of thinking, I'm not, I'm not sure why this guy's talking to me. Like this, you know, this doesn't really make sense. But I'm like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep going with it. This seems good. And um, over time, we uh, just became very good friends and, and even just discovered around this concept of the ark that God had really been speaking to us in very similar ways. And so Chris and I worked together um, in 2013 on actually, we ended up putting together a proposal related to um, the Northfield campus. And, uh, it, and um, did you did just jump in? Did you both have a separate revelation about a type of ark? We did. We did. Yeah. Yeah. And we were working together quite a while before we figured that out. Um, in fact, uh, I think Chris was kind of like, um, we're doing all this stuff together. Do we even have a compatible vision? And uh, it turned out it was more than compatible. It was really, um, in a lot of ways, you know, all, almost the same thing from the Lord. So, but all I have to say, I've, I've uh, worked with Chris and been friends with Chris since then and just really appreciate him. And um, I'm jealous, not in a sinful way, in a good way of what they're doing there in Linfield. Um, I just think it's absolutely tremendous. And uh, as I tell him all the time, he's living the dream. So um, without further ado, um, over to my friend, Christopher. Good morning. Yeah. Good morning. I guess I'll give you a further intro, Chris, so I'm not off the hook. Uh, Chris is the the CAO, Chief Administrative Officer, and then formerly before that, an advisor to JAMA. JAMA stands for, you have to fill that part in, Chris. Yes, Jesus Awakening Movement for America. And you it, met it just Dr. Rolls, it rolls right off the tongue, doesn't it? <laughs> Jesus Awakening Movement for America. There we go. <laughs> Say it real fast. Um, yeah, so Chris used to be a part of the, as, as Jonathan was saying, the Center for World Missions. He was the director, executive director, or something like that. And then transitioned out. We were looking at this Northfield project, and you've you've probably known Dr. Kim for a while now, who's the founder of JAMA. It's a Korean American and Korean diaspora um, a network of of uh, ministries and churches. And you decided you help them, you advise them in purchasing this campus. And maybe Chris, as, as a beginning, you could give us what, what does the ARC mean to you when you and Jonathan were talking about um, the ARC, what does that mean to you? What, what was your vision for the ARC? Why are we using this symbolism of Noah's ARC? Sure. Well, um, the, the beginning of that story, uh, took off January of 2000. And um, I'd like to say there was something more profound to how it began, but it, did, it wasn't. Um, it was literally the top of the new year. <clears throat> I hadn't put together my Bible reading plan for the year. So of course, I just thought, well, it's, you know, it was like January 3rd of the year. And I said, well, I'm just going to start at the beginning and we'll see what happens. We'll work on my plan over the weekend. And I just get into Genesis, I start reading, and I get to this part, of course, where we start reading about 
Noah. And um, I won't get into it now, but there's a couple times in my life that were fairly extraordinary um, encounters with God and really like heard his audible voice. This was one of those moments. And the question that hit me as I read this was, will you build my ark? And I spent the next uh, several hours just in prayer, the next probably three, four hours, just on my face in my living room and just praying and um, just waiting on the Lord. So that's kind of how it began for me in, in that kind of a way, which is uh, no wonder why then I'm still engaged in doing this 20 years later, because you don't forget those things and you don't walk away from those moments um, with him. So part of that idea uh, that happened was the unfolding of this arc uh, when I heard that question. What came through the revelation of that was a 2020 vision. So that same day when the Lord asked, would you build my ark, what came through that was there is a vision for 2020 and beyond. And what he showed me then are the things we're living through today. And so I've been watching in anticipation and in expecting these and other things that are going to unfold in the coming years. And so why these uh, hubs, apostolic centers, uh, places, um, one of the names I give this campus here in Texas is a collaborative kingdom community. And so um, a large part of what we're looking to do is uh, as times continue to get more challenging for more obvious reason, um, we're going to need uh, people and places where we can continue to be creative and um, innovate um, and do uh, kind of building this this next stage of, of growth um, that may not necessarily be so easy to do, um, but we're going to need a, a place uh, and a space to do it. So I'll just pause there for a moment, but it came out of both having a uh, God encounter as well as the vision that came forward from it uh, back in 2000. Hey, that's great. And I'm going to ask you in a moment to talk a little bit more about that vision 2020 and how you shared that with Jonathan, myself and others and what that meant to you and then how you feel like it's unfolded. Um, I'm just going to interject real quick. Um, in my own journey, the Lord was pointing out Genesis 8 uh, when the ark went through the storms and uh, there's some phrases in there where Noah, you really wondered, was Noah wondering what was happening, God? You know, is, is this storm ever going to abate? Mm. Uh, but of course, we know a year into it or so, he finally gets to disembark from the ark. And um, in particular, I just remember the Lord highlighting this seventh month and the 17th day. Um, that's when Noah, I think, the arcs uh, hits the ground and they, they, they start to be able to uh, praise God for, you know, dry land and uh, start to think about, okay, now what? Which was really like a reset for the earth. Mm -hmm. And the ark was a shutting in of uh, all the animals and Noah's family to preserve them and to carry them forward. And I think there's this analogy today for the church, the broader church, to be shut in with God in times of storms. We know the word of God says that everything that can be shaken will be shaken. Um, and so in, in such times, we need an ark, the ark, and this is where the ark of the presence analogy also comes in to double up on analogies. We have the ark of the presence of God, uh, the ark of Israel, um, the ark where the presence sits between the two cherubims, and this, too, is symbolic of being sheltered under the shadow of the Almighty God. Um, so, yeah, tell us about 2020, Chris, and why did that vision stick out to you? And maybe Jonathan can chime in with, uh, you know, the I told you so uh, moment. <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> it, um, it wasn't something that I was really sharing uh, much of the first uh, few years, because I just kept that to myself. It really wasn't more until 2005 and seven uh, through some of the work ministry I was doing with another uh, institute um, and center. And so um, in that context, I began sharing with other 
people, other leaders, different groups. And um, then as I went on from 07 to, I started serving as managing director and executive director of the center and the campus in Pasadena in 2011. I started there advising their chairman, uh, the gentleman who took over from Dr. Ralph Winter when he passed in May of 09. Uh, Dave Datamo was appointed the general director in his place and um, a friend of mine put me in touch with him and I was just spending some time once a month with him for a couple of hours uh, praying and just trying to listen and answer some of his deeper concerns on steering that community moving forward. And so a year after that, he invited me to come in and help him uh, to lead through and envision a new uh, actually create a new vision for the new U.S. Center and, and what that would look like uh, for next generation of global mission. So that's kind of how those things started. In, in the process, when Jonathan mentioned we met, it was uh, March uh, probably 13th through, or yeah, 13th through 15th or so in Kansas City, uh, the Transform World 2020 at IHOP actually was in Kansas City. Yeah, 2013 was that? In 2013. And so I didn't, I'm not sure how much of it I shared with Jonathan at the time, but I just remembered that um, we, I mean, obviously we discussed it somewhat, but part of what I'd always been a little bit hesitant uh, to share, uh, just felt a restraint uh, to not go into it in so much detail. Um, I'll be happy to do it now because this year is um, different, but leading up to this, I just felt the Lord saying, keep it uh, and just work and process through it. And so I did in, in very tangible, physical ways, literally, like at the center. And I'll talk more about it uh, when I met Dr. Kim in 2015. But it was interesting that in 2010, there was a U.S. Center. In 2015, there was uh, the JAMA Global Group. So over the last two segments of these five years, there have been two major opportunities, uh, expressions, to actually work through what that vision is. And um, I can give excruciating detail on the pros and cons of how both of these organizations are moving them forward because it's a challenge uh, no matter what. Um, but I think there's a tremendous amount that I've learned the last 10 years trying to operationalize it. And what I'm hoping to do with uh, you and Jonathan and, and others here too, is see how we might be able to come up with a I'm, I'm always thinking of models. You know, how do we come up with a model that others can take and run with and replicate? Um, because I, you know, I can maybe contribute to one or two or you know, a few of these in my, my lifetime. Um, but we need so many more, uh, not even in the U.S., but around the world. So it'd be wonderful to be able to think of how we can capture some of this um, and share some of what we've learned and see how others could take it and improve on it and expand it and make it so much better. Yeah, so um, because this uh, call, this Zoom, and this group is focused on uh, business and financial ideas and investing and what does this look like, there's, share with us too, um, and maybe we'll get there in a minute, mm -hmm. that aspect, which is like we're trying to integrate all aspects of life and culture, mm -hmm. not just four walls of church, yet today, this morning, we're talking about missions and mission sending. But these things are really integrated in God's sight, are they not? And, and so how do, how do you see those things coming together? You've been serving in these capacities and mission sending organizations for years, but you're also really uh, an entrepreneur and business person at heart. And some of the initiatives that you're gonna talk about, like the farming and building of these mission homes for uh, people to be able to uh, have residency there on campus, um, they're really applying business skill sets as well as uh, process and, and models, and that's a good thing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Well, I, there's, I'll, I'll jump ahead with one statement and then come back, and I'll say, um, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not pleased to say this, but there's just been a growing concern in my mind since early 2000s um, of what would happen when we've reached this state in 2020, when we look around at our um, federal and national condition, and I'm talking about 
economics at the moment um, and see what is our deficit look like. And that's both uh, federal, it's state, it's local, it's corporate, it's personal. Um, all of these levels that we look at and think of, um, there we're redlining in so many of these. And so part of the reason I'm concerned, and I think why these kinds of centers are gonna be vital in the future, um, in part is because we've got to come up with new ways to think about not just the nonprofit donation, because they think those contributions go away. Um, and I won't take another moment to say more about it. You can talk to me offline, but there's been more than enough things, including legislation for many years now that's been floated around both the House and the Senate. So we know that's real. It's just a matter of time. It's not if. And so when it comes down to it, part of the integration of what I've seen is that when I look at our father and you see how he does things, it's always, um, I use these three words to capture my own thoughts and make sure I'm doing a more thorough job of being creative at times. And it's um, comprehensive, integrated, and aligned. And the nature of being comprehensive is, are you looking at all of the facets, really from a strategic perspective? Are you doing it in a way that's integrated so that all of the different component parts that are there, uh, whether early or nascent stage or more mature, um, are given right place at the table. And then alignment has to do with the fit. Um, you can have a comprehensive strategy and they can all be integrated, but the alignment has to do with how they fit in, the, the where they come into, uh, the, you know, when you're playing your sheet music, you wanna make sure you're playing the right notes in the right sequence or it still doesn't sound right. Um, so that alignment throughout uh, helps keep everybody in sync and sounding, uh, you know, as it should. So uh, I could pause there for a minute, but I think that idea of bringing a more entrepreneurial, uh, I, I don't necessarily think of it like a, a business uh, perspective, because I know, you know, some people don't like that. And I've got my own, you know, challenges at times seeing how churches overly brought too much uh, from a business mindset into how we operate. And that doesn't always work well either. So it's got to be done well, no matter what. But the point I'm, I'd be driving home other president, CEO, founders of organizations is uh, at this stage at 2020 beyond, if you don't start thinking of how you're going to replicate and replace 50% of your income starting this next year, uh, you're just so far behind. I don't know what to tell you anymore. Uh, and there's a yeah. lot more ways to do this, but I think the writing's been on the wall the last several years, uh, last 10 really. Um, so most of what I try to do is, is encourage people to be creative, be thoughtful, and start to imagine new ways and new models uh, to do the work in ministry that they want because on the other hand, this other is no longer scalable. Right, so um, what you're really pointing out, which is I think the heart and the heartbeat of what we're trying to do here is we don't want to run our churches. We don't want to run the kingdom of God like it is a uh, uh, for-profit. Uh, the priority is making money. The priority is efficiency. We don't want to do that. But we, we do want to return to the Lord's order and structure um, biblically. Even I'm thinking about like Stephen when he and others were raised up in Acts. Mm -hmm. They were raised up so that the apostles could do their work of being in prayer and the word of God and their administ administration needed to take place. It needed to take place because they had real problems to solve. They had orphans to feed and widows and the distribution of food and so forth. Mm -hmm. That obviously had to get a resource somewhere. Mm -hmm. so there, there's a right place for administration in the, um, in the things of God. It's just, I think the issue has been historically and in the US church, we've adopted worldly models, Babylonian models for how to do that. And we don't need pastors to become CEOs. We need the fivefold ministry to uh, be raised up so that the right people are doing the right things in concert with others. Mm -hmm. And we have a whole nother structure. We don't operate in the same hierarchical structure of capitalism mm -hmm. in the kingdom. Um, but before we go further on that, I'm going to jump back to Jonathan, because I know he's going to go here in a little while. And I want to, and I want to, 
get a discussion going about before we get into the example at, in Linfield, Texas. Um, I want to get to the four in the one. Um, and maybe Jonathan, as part of the arc, could describe the baby changing table vision that someone had and that began to, you know, put into place like what, what could these centers look like and how do we collaborate amongst ministries um, in such centers? Uh, and so maybe we could uh, jump back there. And Jonathan, if you want to share anything about what struck you uh, from Chris in the 2020 vision as part of that, please do. Yeah, yeah, I'll just say with Chris, um, Greg, I'm getting a lot of feedback on your end. Um, Chris has been talking about 2020 and being prepared for 2020 since I've known him. And it's been one of those things, you know, where I'm like, okay, what, what exactly is he seeing here? Uh, it sounds like 2020 is going to be pretty, uh, difficult. And, um, so, you know, just to kind of confirm that, uh, what he's sharing, um, you know, earlier this year, I was like, dude, what's going on? You've been talking about this for a long time. And, uh, Clearly, this is not a normal year. Um, so I think that's, uh, you know, just an interesting point. And I think Chris definitely is carrying a word for the body that uh, he's been stewarding, you know, for these last 20 years. But in terms of the ARC, um, we did these 10-day prayer events in Northfield, Massachusetts, at the campus that D.L. Moody founded starting in 2007. And at our uh, our event in 2008, um, God started speaking to a number of us about this idea of the ark, about um, a place of his presence and um, a place of refuge from testing. Uh, we felt that Northfield was going to be an ark. And uh, as part of this word, um, God even uh, had one of our uh, people who was there praying um, he said, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to show you something. And, and we were in this old uh, kind of like empty dorm building. And essentially the Lord's like, I'm going to give you a present. It's, you know, over here, um, in this closet. And he's like, what is, there's nothing, you know, uh, and it was a full scale, like 3d model of an arc that you could build like a puzzle. It was a 3d puzzle. Um, and so it's just kind of like one confirmation of, of what God was speaking to us. Um, so this, this had been kind of a, a longstanding thing in um, our minds, my mind. Um, I had never heard, you know, around 2012, people started talking about this idea of apostolic centers. Um, and, um, and what does that know, mean was, to you? What is, what is an apostolic center? Well, it didn't mean anything to me at first. Um, I was like, this is like the charismatic flavor of the week. Um, and uh, so I didn't, you know, I, see, I didn't know. I see Gary smiling over there. He can't help himself. <laughs> he, he loves all this terminology. Well, I, I just didn't know what it meant. And, you know, I'm like, how did all these people know to start talking about this? So um, they must have read the same book or something. Anyway, so, but in 2013, um, in prayer, the Lord just showed me these it was like a map and he showed me all these uh, like, like lines rising up. And I knew, I, I, and he was like, these are apostolic centers. They were like points coming off the map. I knew the height represented like the depth of revelation and some were, you know, just kind of low, some were very high. Um, but these were all things God was doing. And um, so that's, so that, that's as salient as, um, as all these other crazy names, that vision you had, lines. Oh, yeah, I'm not, I'm probably not explaining it very well, but it was like, it was a map with just seeing like, almost like, like you could like graphing, uh, it was like graphing these different points where there were, were centers of worship and prayer and missions and unity um, that were, you know, at different levels of maturity. Uh, but they were all part of this thing God was doing of raising up apostolic centers. And so I, I started to understand this concept of the ark was actually tied to the concept of apostolic centers, um, places of sending. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's a place of sending as well as a place of shelter. 
Um, and then in uh, 2013, to make a long story short, it was just a year of incredible acceleration. Um, God began to um, really um, move uh, our ministry from something, you know, very local in the New England area to something more national and global. Um, and um, the stuff related to Northfield was really exploding at that time, even though it didn't ultimately work as uh, Chris and I and others had hoped. Um, it was still just a real season of expansion. And um, part of that um, was I was going to Pasadena to meet with Chris and meet with Dave Datema and um, meet with folks at the center and just talk about Northfield, talk about this art concept. And uh, as I was going, I felt led to go and meet with um, a woman who had been praying over Northfield since before I was born. Her name was Ethel Doolittle. And I just felt like it was important to honor her as an intercessor. And um, so I went, I went, I met with her and um, all that to say, she had had a vision and she wanted to share with me. Vision was of a changing table and it was a, a table, um, you know, a table with four baskets that fit into the table. Um, and then she said, I also had another vision. It was of a flagpole with four smaller flagpoles all around it. And, uh, you know, I was, you know, I was kind of like, I feel like this vision has to do with God's vision for Northfield, um, being an arc or apostolic center, that there's some kind of a collaborative shape to it. Of, you know, we started calling the four and one for uh, organizations kind of within one structure, potentially it was one interpretation. Uh, but in her vision, there were different objects in the different baskets. So um, it may be more complex than that, but just to make a long story short, I left Ethel the next day I flew to Pasadena and Dave um, and Chris, I met with them and they've put this sort of beginning of a business plan, um, just really just some ideas, put it in front of me and I, I was reading it and it's talking about a collaborative you know, organizational approach and it's literally articulating in like business language, the, the four in one concept that Ethel had told me about. Um, you know, as an intercessor, as just someone hearing from God. What what uh, year was that? Uh, that was 2013. Thanks. So that that was I, I was kind of like, wow, this is very confirming that this is something God is speaking. And you know, like a lot of these things, we didn't as we kind of dug into it further, we began to understand this was actually just a, almost a, a, an articulation of the fivefold ministry in Ephesians four. As, as kind of like fleshed out into a um, seeing all five of those things happening, you know, in a, in a isolated area, a missions base, a sending center, uh, and, um, you know, the fivefold are similar in that the apostolic is kind of like the, the one that, that kind of joins everything together, but the other four are all essential, just like on your hand, you have four fingers and a thumb. And, um, and so we started seeing that God had been speaking to us about this four and one. We hadn't understood it as tying into other parts of scripture, but that, that was part of what God was seeing. So these apostolic centers or arc centers are, they're a place of refuge from uh, storms of testing. They're also a place of the presence of God, uh, the arc in, the, in that sense. Um, they're a place, it's like a microcosm of the whole kingdom of God, um, but it's like a, a concentrated experimental zone of collaboration, partnership, unity. It's a place where I think we could start to see Jesus' prayer in John 17 lived out. Um, and um, yeah, I, I, mean, I just think these are, this is something I think God is going to want to do increasingly um, in the earth over the years as we we move towards the time of the lord's return so hey that's that's great and i put up on the screen here um something that you chris and i collaborated on in 2016 because we kind of had a redo in 2016 in approaching northfield 
and we had some revelation around that and um, part of it was taking out, well, what, what is another way of describing this four in one? And so what we did was, I'll just read this quote, functionally, what do we understand so far? We're speaking with respect to the proposed uses of the campus. There seem to be several common threads to all the areas, whether the pioneering team, which was like a local team that Jonathan was a part of there in Western Mass, the New England Alliance, which is a, representing the unity across the New England churches, the ark, which is what we're talking about now, or, or the legacy of what historically has happened on the D.L. Moody campus. So these common threads emerged. We were talking about an analogy of the hands and the fivefold and how they work together. But another thing we've spoken about on these calls is having a house of prayer in the center of whatever we do um, for the Lord. And so prayer uh, and worship has to be at the center of that. So that's an aspect. That's like the one, the one thing that we, we, we center things around, around the Lord's presence, our vertical uh, integration with him. And then we have the horizontal parts, uh, missions, sending out. So Deal Moody famously, uh, the student volunteer movement was started there in the 1800s. And young people from across college campuses were sent out to the ends of the earth, even uh, unto death. Um, that was a key part of what they were doing. Moody's whole inspiration was to build a school uh, for young women to be educated in the Lord and educated in vocation. Uh, that's kind of what started the campus. Uh, but he also had a heart for not just letting the campus be idle. They, they, they used to gather in the summertime um, across the U.S. People would come in a pilgrimage uh, as, a, as like an expression of church unity coming to the campus of Northfield. And then local community, that they were not just um, a hippie commune apart from what was going on in that community. They literally created community. Uh, there was a hotel there. They planted a church there, which is the Trinity Church in Northfield. Um, it, many things were going on in the normal course of life as part of the local community expression there as well. So this is one of the ways of looking at this arc this four in the one. Um, and part of that 2016 revelation was the deeper integration God was calling for, like a deeper unity in any of these centers, um, as opposed to just having a, a four ministries split a campus up, what about having it all working together, uh, even as Moody had it back then? So, if uh, anything else to add there, Jonathan, if not, I'll just transition back over to Chris. No, back to Chris. So Chris, we, uh, we now fast forward to after 2016 and reopening the Northfield campus and some of those visions there um, without going down that thread, you, you were now pursuing around those times your work with Dr. Kim. Maybe you could start there and uh, talk about the vision. This type of vision mm -hmm. is now being implemented. Mm -hmm. um, if you scroll down, anyone who's on this page, you'll see a write-up Chris provided me of the different aspects. Um, I could share that screen too. Sure. Um, so yeah, Christopher, pick up from there. Um, so I'll, I'll just say this in a more funny way to begin. Um, after I finished my time with the U.S. Center, I had a, a five-year agreement or contract, ended up being closer to almost six. Um, but when I was completing that, I asked, and asked the Lord and said, well, you know, what's the next step look like? And I had this word from him before I wrapped up my um, time with them. And the word was rest and write. And I can't tell you, I had a big smile on my face. That was great. Uh, the only downside was that the rest was short and um, it wasn't as long as I wanted. <laughs> the, the reason I mention it is because I, I was uh, introduced to Dr. Kim uh, by a friend of mine and at the time he was starting this other project. If you want to Google it, I'll put the URL up there in the Zoom 
chat, but it's called lifearc.net. Um, his name's Charles Wee, he's in Pasadena. He's a fairly renowned architect and has built um, a few significant cities in South Korea and other countries in Southeast Asia. Anyway, he's got this life arc project. Um, and if you caught that last word in there, arc, um, that was interesting because in my transition, he said, I'm trying to figure out how to create housing for people around um, Brazil and the Amazon and the Mekong Delta and what's happening to literally hundreds of millions of people around the world where their livelihoods and their agriculture and their, you know, everything is being demolished and wiped away every year just based on floods and um, waters rising and what have you. Long story short, I worked through and helped him to define and, and eventually launch that initiative. In the process, he introduced me to Dr. Kim and that was in the summer of 2015. And um, for when you get to meet Dr. Kim, you'll know uh, this is part of the, um, part of his personality. Um, but after we had this very long four hour dinner, sharing his heart and just um, really unfolding what he'd been seeing and this vision he had for a campus and a college and this kind of training center came out of a place when he had lymphoma cancer uh, in his, uh, this was almost 15 years ago. And so at the end of dinner, he looked at me and said, Christopher, well, um, what I, I've waited long enough. And he looked at me and he just said, I'd like you to find my campus. <laughs> and what do you say to that? So, you know, you just, I <laughs> smiled and said, sure, Dr. Kim, no problem. I'll get right on that. I'll, you know, I'll take care of that for you. Who, you know? is this, who is the mystery man, Dr. Kim? Give us a little bit about why sure. he's interesting and in, in the Korean community, especially, as well as the yeah. Christian body generally. Dr. For Kim, sure. that just seems made up. I mean, I think right. that's the name of 50% of Koreans, right? So are you even telling <laughs> us the truth here? Well, we'll get you in behind the scenes today. So uh, Dr. Kim um, was an uh, eight-year-old boy, 1950, during the Korean War. And um, long story short, he ended up um, getting married and moved to the U.S. and came here to USC, the University of Southern California, um, to complete a master's and he did his PhD and um, believe he was the first, certainly first South Korean, maybe the first, um, I won't say Asian American because he likes to say he's an American with Korean heritage. So I say it that way in honor of Dr. Kim today. Um, but he focused on American government and political studies at USC, got his PhD there, and went on to teach at Pepperdine University, and then um, got recruited to go to University of Alaska, where he spent 17 years serving there, and also served as the uh, advisor to the governor of Alaska in energy, environment, and economics. And he did a number of different multilateral um, programs or projects with the State Department uh, here, both the U.S., including China, Russia, Korea, Japan, a number of countries while he was there, started a think tank, which is still there um, in Alaska as part of their uh, university system. Um, and so he, he was able to work in an area of both ministry, business, um, policy, and education. And if we have time, I'll talk a little bit more about that. But when I think in terms of what's essential for our generation and the one behind us who are going to lead effectively and more strategically, um, it's my hope that um, more men and women um, take the time to really develop that understanding of how all four of those areas at the minimum are required to really discern how to do any one of those areas well, uh, because the times we're in and where we're going, obviously changing dramatically, um, but you've gotta be able to be functional and fluid in understanding what's happening in those areas. So that's a part of Dr. Kim's history. 
JAMA is an organization that's been around for 27 years. And if you think of it more like an umbrella organization to the Korean diaspora in the United States, it's roughly 9 million people, 4,500 churches, and they have um, connections to people in over 80 of the 181 countries where Korean diaspora live. And so that's a little bit about JAMA. Their focus had largely been because of the extraordinary um, gift and sacrifice America had made during the 1950 to 53 Vietnam War. Dr. Kim always had this and still does, has this extraordinary um, love, not just for America, but also this desire to want to uh, bless her and bless this nation and to find ways for the Korean Americans who are here to be more active and um, aware of how they can invest and serve in their local communities. And um, if you were here, you know, you would hear him say it's, it's never, of course, to repay a debt you can't. Um, but it's at least a way to humbly honor and respectfully thank uh, those tens of thousands of soldiers uh, who fought and gave their life. And, you know, when you look back at the Korean Memorial, I won't get it right because I haven't memorized it, but um, it's a beautiful phrase or saying that something like uh, from American perspective, you know, it's they came and served for a country they didn't, they never had been to and died for people they never knew. And so that, that just has always really been at the heart of where Dr. Kim and so many uh, that are part of JAMA come from is trying to find ways to uh, contribute and to invest in and to strengthen uh, the country that gave them their life back. And interestingly, isn't there a tie between D.L. Moody, student volunteer movement, missionaries being sent to Korea, uh, Christianity expanding in Korea, and Dr. Kim's journey? There, well, absolutely. There were two earlier missionaries that went into, um, well, even North Korea earlier when it was just one unified Korea and who took the, the gospel uh, there. Um, in, very interestingly, uh, Dr. Kim's wife, um, Sarah, uh, Miss Kim, her family grew up and she is from North Korea. Um, her father was one of the first medically trained doctors there. Um, and so they had um, opportunity. Um, I think it was her father's, it was her grandfather, if I'm remembering correctly, but um, they basically have five generations of um, pastors uh, in their families, uh, both pastors or medical doctors or pastors and, you know, bivocational, um, but in Korea, but um, five generations of Sarah's family uh, were believers in some of the earlier families uh, that came to faith um, in the late 1800s. Amazing. Amazing how God um, does that cross collaborative work from nation to nation. Hmm. This is just an example across those five generations. Mm -hmm. Really cool that we were working on the Northfield project and you know now you're working on this. Um, mm -hmm. This is like a sewing back in of the Korean community, which is amazing. Uh -huh. uh, it's in the JAMA name. Let's uh, take a moment, because uh, I want to leave plenty of time for a question and answer, uh -huh. uh, to go through the components that you listed and what are you building exactly on those 500 acres? And I uh, have oh, sure. here on the screen share. Go ahead. Yeah, well, of course. Uh, well, I, in not any particular order, but at the top of the list here, um, education, of course, is a big piece. The reason the 471 acre campus was important, you will start to see in a moment, uh, a portion of that uh, we're dedicating uh, to the launch of a new uh, four-year undergraduate college. And so uh, that's going to be an integration of um, a few um, core uh, liberal studies, but also uh, have a integrated great uh, books uh, type of program along with it as well. Um, you'll, you'll hear me talk about this more later, um, but part of what I'm crafting into the framework of this school are 
two things that I'm working with right now, a friend of mine who's uh, working with us as a chief academic officer, former associate provost at Cal Baptist University. Um, there's a, a fun little equation that uh, I've developed. You'll probably get to hear me come up with these things. I've got to come up with stuff like this to remember the things that I'm working on. So it's really for my benefit. Um, but I say um, in the equation for the college and what we're exploring, we're looking at uh, moral knowledge. Uh, some of you know that uh, Dr. Um, Willard came up with a book, The Disappearance of Moral Knowledge. Uh, if you haven't read it, look at it. Uh, there's a hundred page download for free. You can get online. It's extraordinary. Um, but the idea of the disappearance of moral knowledge and what that's meant to Western and North American society the last couple hundred years in particular. Uh, but moral knowledge and moral courage equal moral responsibility. And so I'm trying to look at that as a part of a framework for the four-year undergraduate program, along with this idea of looking at how do we uh, develop personally disciple and professionally develop students so that, yes, they understand a measure of servant leadership, of course, which is important. Um, but in the times we're moving into, uh, even leadership will fail. Uh, and we need people who have an understanding of what it is to be a statesman. And so uh, statesmanship is going to be one of those elements of the school that we're highlighting and want to thread throughout uh, each of the different disciplines and programs of of the college. So to go through some of these others, um, you'll notice the JAMA Foundation, largely to help to develop uh, an investment fund that can seed new initiatives, new ideas. And so uh, JAMA itself, just so you're aware, is structured actually as a church. And so um, that's our legal structure uh, and how we operate in part. Um, the foundation is a separate entity. The college is a separate entity. Um, JAMA Global Ministries um, is a collaborative. Um, there's another group on our campus that is a separate organization as well, uh, completely focused on um, mission. A major part of what they do is medical missions, uh, not too dissimilar to Mercy Ships, except minus the ship. Uh, but they do a lot. They've built hospitals and medical centers and clinics and given nearly 80 plus million dollars over the years uh, to different facilities uh, around the world. And so they're based on our campus as well. Uh, they sold their offices and co-located to Texas with us this year. Um, and their staff are moving into housing, which we'll get to in a moment. Um, the conference facility and center really just deals with the campus itself. And um, of course, there's along with the foundation uh, mentioning the incubator uh, because there are a handful of other projects or ventures that we're exploring right now, again, for uh, pushing the envelope, um, generating revenue, but also looking at how do we get into and find expression within closed or creative access countries. And we know that that's only becoming more and more a challenge in the decade ahead. So that's why the incubator is interesting. And then Mission Grove Homes, uh, I hope you go and take a look at. It's a fascinating pilot project. We're looking at building 50 homes for retired missionaries or ministry you know, uh, professionals, maybe former pastors. Um, you know, a number of people who were um, sent out from even Korea that went all over the country. Uh, when they left their country and their land there per acre was valued at next to nothing. And when they came back 30 years later, you couldn't buy an acre of land in some parts of South Korea for under a million dollars. And so what a number of churches we've seen, not just Korea, but even here in the US, North America had done a really poor job of thinking ahead and planning and forecasting. Uh, we did a great job of the ekbalo and the sending out, uh, but we really just did not have a thorough comprehensive, integrated, or aligned understanding, like I mentioned earlier, of what is it going to mean for that full life cycle for a person to serve, live, and then come back and complete uh, maybe another phase of their ministry in their uh, mature, more senior years. 
So anyway, we're creating Mission Grove Homes to be a place where we're bringing back in uh, these missionaries, pastors, ministry leaders, and we're inviting them to be the uh, mentors and spiritual directors for the students in our college uh, so that they have one-to-one -one mentorship as part of our community and in their program, which I think will be exceptional. And then Mission Grove Farms and Gardens, I think is pretty straightforward, but uh, I just like the idea when we envisioned this five years ago to create an agri-hood. So the larger scope of homes, we may have upwards of 300, 350 homes on the campus, um, but interspersed throughout it, um, we have extraordinary uh, trees. We're in the East Texas piney wood area. So a lot of water, a lot of trees. It's green, it's lush, it's beautiful. Uh, we've got huge lakes all over, uh, just a, a 10, 15 minute drive from our campus. Um, so it's a beautiful place to be. Um, and um, anyway, that I think it just all adds to um, that ability to um, not only do great work, uh, but also be in a place that's beautiful and that helps you think uh, more creatively. And um, lastly, uh, I put down there some things related to next stage. Uh, those are kind of things that were just in the exploratory area. Um, some of you are probably very familiar with EB5 type programs. Um, that one's pretty high risk at the moment, um, not because it wouldn't be viable, um, but because with all the challenges with travel um, and also the issues just, um, how can I say it simply, you know, our relationship with different countries are changing more frequently. And so um, U.S. and Korea and a couple other countries seem like they'll be stable over the next decade, um, but we're trying to determine if uh, there are people and investors there who want to be part of uh, this collaborative kingdom vision and uh, would like to invest through that kind of opportunity. And I mentioned it on there only because I wanted you all to be able to get the sense of the breadth and the scope of what I'm looking at. So when I'm talking about be creative, uh, I'm maybe this, maybe you've got other ideas that are more creative than this and I'd love to hear it. Um, but as far as putting a REIT together in order to create, you know, a few hundred homes on this campus plus other a land we're looking to acquire, like a, a community land trust where we can build on a couple thousand acres. Um, we're looking at an EB-5 program that lets investors come and invest in the U.S. and accelerate their citizenship, which is what that program is. It's an immigration. Yeah, I was going to say, is that program. an immigration? Is that an immigration yeah. thing? The EB-5. Yeah. So it's an Im immigration investment program, and so that's why I mentioned for those that were familiar with it, you know why that's can be a challenge these days in particular. Um, but I was looking at that program because the relationships that we have through the network, if we were to attract most of those investors that come provide anywhere between a million to 2 million per family. So we did an assessment and felt like we could get about 150 to 160 conservatively families that would come and that could represent you know, close to a $200 million um, financial raise. And then domestically through the qualified opportunity zones and funds, there's other things that have been going on now for close to a couple of years. Some of you are using or aware of, I'm sure as well. So anyway, we're just, we're looking at other things that maybe are, you know, outside the norm for sure of what a church or mission organization would do. But to Greg's point, these are some of the more basic things that I think, um, require you to look at how you do your work. And when I say comprehensive, this is the kind of thing I'm looking at is how do we do it from a very complementary and comprehensive way? Because an EB-5 program or QOZ or qualified fund, they're really straightforward vehicles to use. Um, and there's no reason if they fit within the structure or facilitate the work that you need, um, you know, why you wouldn't at least consider or evaluate it uh, to see it fits in with the feasibility of your plan. So I'm looking at all possibilities um, because, um, you know, we, again, like we said earlier, when things start really moving and changing, um, the dynamics of how we're going to fund church and work here domestically over the next 10 years is going to radically shift. Yeah, so this, this is really good. I mean, I think 
what you're saying is the, this arc is both a retreat as well as a way to advance. And so people can come and gather and get recharged and trained and equipped and prepared. But then the whole idea is to go out, be sent out. And it's not just foreign missions that you guys are thinking about, right? I mean, you're thinking about an incubator in exchange with uh, University of Texas, I think, and Tyler. Mm -hmm. You're looking at ways of integrating into the community. So um, this is not just a utopian, we're in isolation off the grid. This is really a, no, we want to be statesmen going out to express the fullness of what God is saying at this time to help America and the nations uh, come into their rightful alignment with God. Um, is that is that fair? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the first things I did two years ago is I met a director of innovation at a phenomenal school locally. It's K through 12. Uh, it's called All Saints in Tyler, Texas. And um, long story short, um, you, you can look this online or Google it, but there's something called FAB, a fab lab. And it was designed and developed by MIT many years ago. Um, they were awarded a use of one at this high school campus. And one of the first things the students did there several years ago was build an arm for an amputee in El Salvador. And these were sophomores in high school. So they sent him a prototype, fitted it with someone down there, sent it back, did this two or three times. And this other young boy who's roughly about their same age had now, uh, you know, like he couldn't afford um, getting, you know, a, a arm in hand because he'd had his uh, arm uh, injured at his elbow. And so they created this um, new, um, um, it's early on, losing my words but anyway as he was an amputee they used this as a way to help to minister to him and his family and they've done things like that multiple times so they've integrated uh, technology health science mission and um, and just reaching out uh, to different uh, people in countries like that so the reason it's interesting is because there's a school like this you know it's east texas so it's a different region of our country uh, it's not silicon valley it's not Los Angeles, California, or you know, some of the other major cities. But what's extraordinary here, and why I started to work on developing an incubator, is because there's the same level of creative, curious, innovative, young minds, talented people. Um, and for any of you who have worked with those in Silicon Valley, you know the culture there is as warped and toxic as it can get. So why send them off to those places to have to, you know, work with or get exposed to that when we can mentor, develop, and help to um, bring those ideas, you know, forward right here and stimulate an economy. So to your point, we're doing things that are very local, grassroots, regional, on the ground, and developing an economy alongside uh, the community that we're in. And why they hadn't done it before? Um, you know, we all have different, you know, I don't know, they, anybody could have done this anytime they wanted to. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's just something that we saw and something that's a missing gap. And so we just stepped in and started to stir the pot and, and it sure. took off. Hey, listen, I want to hone in on some of these mm -hmm. concepts, socioeconomic concepts that you guys are deploying mm -hmm. um, that are new. That I feel like it's the new wine skin in the new way. Um, one is this, and by the way, I, Chris was alluding to earlier, this change, this shift that's occurring in our country and will continue to occur, which is the normal course of make lots of money and then donate lots of money to ministries, make money on the one side and then donate into good works on the other. Those days are, are, are fading. And so now we have to think instead of trusting in the almighty dollar to get everything done in mission work and in ministry work, we have to start thinking about, well, how would God cause it to be such that it's self-sustained and not dependent on our banking system, our markets, our currency, and all these other factors. <laughs> and so um, one of the tales that Chris could share is like, we were talking about the endowment one day for JAMA and Chris had this experience of praying about it. 
and seeing, um, I'll let you share, like seeing these trees uh, and what the meaning of that had. But I'm putting in the chat this 12-page uh, white paper. I wrote it almost 10 years ago. It gets into these dynamics. It gets into now we have to change and shift as the church. And churches are going to have to stop being so donor dependent. And they're even going to start to have to adopt <coughs> economic models of self-sustainability. Mi ministries throughout the world, um, especially in third world countries, are so dependent now on the U.S. dollars being raised to fund a variety of things, food, clothing, just basics. And is it not better if God could create sustainable local community where no community is dependent on dollars? They're dependent on the Lord. They're dependent on their the network of relationships, but they're they're based wherever they're based. God can make you thrive. I, um, I'm going to turn it back over, Chris. Mm -hmm. Just share maybe about the um, the walnuts. <laughs> There's a. I just saw this two nights ago. Um, it's called. Uh, I, I believe it's called Call of the Forest. Call of the Forest. Uh, it's the name of a documentary film it's about an hour and 20 minutes long i can't remember the lady's name who highlighted in there uh, but she's a um, botanist and scientist and has just a, an exceptional love of nature and her family i believe is originally from ireland as well uh, long story short i was watching this video the other night um, and right about halfway through it of all of the different, I mean, think of the thousands of trees that could have been talked about. Um, they go into this expression of Canada to the US and they see the depletion from 1850 to present of the hard woods throughout the North American continent. And I'm listening and intrigued and oh, that's interesting. And um, she gets to this point where she says, and one of the most valued trees that's there, but is now nearly extinct, but is still in high demand, are black walnut trees. And I thought, well, isn't that fascinating? The reason I mention it is because I was just on the campus, this was in the last few months, as we're building these homes. So I'm going into our wooded areas and we're clearing out small places and getting more familiar with the other 350 acres in the back that some of which I haven't even walked or driven on yet. Um, but Long story short, um, I find these really strange looking, ex, you know, you, you don't really see them as walnuts. They're the size of a softball. So if you think of a softball, that's the size of a black walnut fruit that falls <laughs> off the tree. They're, they're enormous, at least a baseball or bigger. And they're green and they're incredibly hard. I mean, so the work it would take to even crack this and open it and get the actual nut out of this is, you know, it's no wonder they're expensive. All that to say though, a mature black walnut tree um, after, you know, 40, 45 years, or usually they can harvest at 30, but somewhere around 30, 40 years, they're very valuable uh, tree. And so it just dawned on me, how easy would it be on parts of our campus where we have these pines and I'm clearing, I have to do this anyway, because it's part of our forestry uh, plan for the campus. But I thought, why wouldn't it make sense uh, to plant a black walnut grove? So listen, friends, because this is fun. If you have any spare land around, uh, they don't work in the West Coast as well as they do in this area and through the Northern Indiana and uh, northern regions, but all that to say, um, the research I did, they had some folks that were starting to replant groves, put 400 trees on one acre, and the yield on that was eight million dollars. See, Greg, everyone's awake now. Isn't that funny? I'm just joking. So eight million dollars on one acre 400 trees, and that's about 30 plus years later. So from a foundation perspective, um, if you had do the math, 10 acres, $80,000, $80 million, 
you know, even if you were able to recapture half of it or a fraction of it, uh, the point is there are other things that we also wanted to look at creatively because that's one of the still more sought after trees. It's now sadly um, been so over harvested uh, that it's becoming more uh, difficult for manufacturers and, and other organizations uh, who use that wood for specialty and luxury products to use. But all that to say, it's interesting to see how there's the hardwoods in North America that have a very high value have been, um, you know, taken and over forested for so many decades now. So it's again, it's another one of those areas that is, it does take some time and some money and some cost to develop, of course, but from the standpoint of what is your investment versus your return? And if your organization is looking to do something like this, um, I could tell you being in this area through Arkansas and some other places, uh, you can buy some large patches of land for not much money next to some decent, really nice environments and water, uh, plant yourself a grove, and whether anyone will be buying black walnut uh, in 30 years from now, that's the guess. <laughs> um, but for what it would take in the investment to do it, if you had a property, why wouldn't you set up a five to 10 acre grove in the outside possibility that the market's there and, um, and it's still viable, you know at the very least you're gonna get a much higher premium for that wood that you ever will over pines or oaks or anything else. So you know that your investment is at least gonna be worth more than all of those combined. Um, and you know who knows? So again, it's just thinking about it in those terms to be creative and imagine you know, what are the other natural resources literally sometimes um, right there on your property or your campus or facility that you know, God could inspire or you know, quicken you to see and um, utilize. Yeah, so there, there are some walnuts already on the property, yeah, historically or no? No, we have, we have, well, now that I know what they are, I didn't even know what they were before. I just, you know, walking around thinking, what are these green lumps getting in my way? Um, some of these trees, when you harvest them, are worth between seven, eight thousand dollars a tree. Um, and in general terms, you can get, you know, maybe 500 you know, or so for other trees in general. So just so a you, sense of value. So you, you already have some startup capital. That's what you're telling me. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> we're, we're going around tagging all those trees. And here's one fascinating reason why I mention it, because if any of you can use this or you know other people who have property, uh, encourage them to explore and research it. The, the reason this lady, this doctor, this botanist talked about the black walnut tree in particular and I, I know nothing of this, so I'm ignorant. I'm just telling you, you know, third hand what I can remember after watching this at 11 at night. But the idea is there are certain trees based on their root structures and the chemical nature of how they grow that actually helps the other trees and other agriculture around them thrive more. A pine tree and oak tree do not have the same chemical composition and don't put back into the ground or help necessarily um, create that same synergetic, synergetic or dynamic um, within the soil structures and root structures around. So the other reason why this tree is fascinating is because it has a higher composition and a capacity or capability to really energize or to strengthen the vitality and the richness of the soil of everything else that grows around it. So all the more reason why it's interesting um, because you can harvest the nuts of it, but even the tertiary benefits of planting those trees in your planned community or near your five acres where you're doing agriculture, um, it just seems to be one of those things that God has, cr again, creatively done. That's amazing, uh, but has so many multiple benefits that it's just, uh, it's an exceptional find in that sense. So those are the kinds of things we're just hoping to identify more of and share with other people and uh, to whatever degree they can use them or incorporate them in their programs or projects, that'd be great. 
Yeah, that's great. Uh, you're talking about ecosystems. There's so much that can be unlocked through the lands that in modern production theory and so forth, we don't think through anymore. I know you guys have uh, greenhouses there as well, and you can even create microclimates within greenhouses for the same effect. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that Chris and I are working on collaborating on is what are some parallel um, alternative financial vehicles, both for mission sending resourcing work as well as alternative currency ideas. Um, we don't need to get all into that now, but we are exploring that because of the relational strengths within their JAMA network. And what would it look like if we created something that is an alternative, can work side by side with our existing systems, but won't necessarily be impacted or fail if our existing systems fail, such as the banking system and the financial system. Uh, any thoughts there quick before I open it to Q&A, Chris, as to why that is, excites or interests you? Um, the, only, the only thing I'll say more immediately is um, when we think about the number of uh, missionaries from the um, from JAMA's perspective and the number of churches internationally that we connect with or can collaborate with, um, finding ways, uh, alternative ways to support them uh, in field and to give them uh, more access uh, to um, resources is gonna be important. Um, not always being able to have money um, flow through local banks or um, you know center uh, financial uh, centers uh, in some countries you know creates liabilities uh, as we all know so coming up with other ways to continue to keep people uh, resourced as we like to say um, you want to keep the supply line to the front line uh, as short and simple as possible so that's just one additional way to do that remittances like you said earlier are a huge piece um, so there's that one side of it, but the other side is just, you know, funding work in field, which is pretty critical. Great. All right. So let's open up the floor. Uh, just raise your hand if you have a question for Chris. Anything goes. Chris will draw the boundaries if, if he needs to. Um, but yeah, whatever's, whatever's interesting to you, uh, please let's ask Chris. I see Lois waving her hand. Is that a is that Lois goes first? Go ahead, Lois. Or she's waving goodbye. I have to go. So one or the other. <laughs> Just want to get the answer. Thanks for having me. See you next week. That's great. Okay, okay. see you. You are waving goodbye. All right. Anyone else um, have a question for Chris? Steve. Steve Reedy, go ahead. Chris, thank you for... Yeah, Chris, thank you for your presentation this morning and for your many years of work. A um, couple things. I noticed you, you guys have a 30 or 50 year or more time horizon as kingdom investors. And that is so different from, you know, our three to seven year investment horizon that most of us unconsciously walk around with. You know, the mm -hmm. tree thing was great. So um, my question is, and you've, ref you've referenced this already. Um, do you believe that there's sort of an imminence to the change of the existence of, of, of the nonprofit exclusion, you know, from taxes and all that, you know, sort of an, as an across the board thing, are we gonna see the end of the 501c3? And does part of your sustainability model, is, is that, was that part of the impetus for the sustainability model? Um, sure. Well, I'll say it this way. You, you're probably familiar with B Corporation. Yeah. Yeah. So that emerged because people wanted a hybrid and wanted to see an expression of things that had more corporate social responsibilities. That kind of terminology, you know, we all saw coming out of the late 80s, you know, late 90s, early 2000s, the last 20 years. And so that's, kind of taking its shape and form from a corporate structure when the, I'll start here because it's the most tactical and practical expression of what I can point to to give you an awareness of what's really happening. And it's 
go to the top 20 university endowments. Many of those are at the 500 million to multi-billion dollar sizes. If you look at those organizations and just Google search and do a little reading for a moment, you will quickly come to find that the government has already been getting its fingers behind the scenes into taxing those endowments and starting to take a portion of those proceeds because the money's just stacking up for the last 30, 40, 50 years and it's not being utilized. So the, yeah, comp the compromise they're making is if you were using the money, we wouldn't be doing this. But if you're just gonna let it sit there, uh, I'm, I'm a little bit Sicilian, so bear with me. You know, but the government comes in and says, but we wanna get a little taste too. So, you know, when you see it, when you see it, <laughs> thank you, Greg. When <clears throat> you see, that's right. From the guys on the East Coast, you'd think you'd appreciate that. Um, when you see an industry that that's, it's that large, it's you know, 20, 30 billion dollars, but that's nothing compared to the over 350 billion dollar nonprofit market that's there. So just think very practically for a moment. Common sense. When you look out and you see what industry or market sectors left where the government has any ability to get taxable income, the only one left is the nonprofit sector. And it's the only sizable sector that's still around the three to 400 billion size annually. So being that the government's relatively broke and many states are bankrupt, um, they don't really have, in a sense, they have options, but they're going to choose the easy route and they're going to start taxing that money. So 501c3s don't go away, but what they do is the IRS changes what's taxable within your structure and what they can get their hands on. So your structure as church won't change, but how they operate and what's taxable and what's accessible will change dramatically. Changing regulation, yeah, that's right. Uh, can do it sort of backdoor. Uh, any other questions, Steve or others, for Chris? Stephen in Dallas area, go ahead. You're muted. Um, hey, thank you, Chris. Um, just it is. Is going off grid then a is, is that part of your vision uh, where you can be truly self sustaining and be off the banking system and and thus avoid uh, the intrusion of government? Um, yeah, I wouldn't use the phrase off grid. Um, I mean, we do have some solar on buildings just from a standpoint of smart investment and saving tens of thousands of dollars where it's practically useful. Um, uh, I'm not hoarding cans of beans, so I'm not worried about that. Um, but I think from the standpoint, the phrase that I'd use is, you know, as it relates to what Greg said earlier, um, in certain segments of our market economy in the US right now, and especially uh, overseas, um, There's a phrase, if you go online, I, I mentioned this because that way everyone can take a note or write it down or look at it real time as we do, but you can Google complementary currencies and we might have captured it and then Greg might have captured it in the notes that's online for us today. But the reason that's interesting is these kinds of things have been around for a long time. I mean, hundreds of years, this isn't new. Um, I mean, the very first thing you go back to that I love and I think it's cool because it's beautiful, but it's wampum. I mean, what was wampum when we first got here? It not only was a currency, but it was even more than that. It was literally a peace treaty. It was what they would uh, share in exchange uh, as a sign of their token of understanding of agreements between tribes and cultures in our country and their people. And so it had extraordinary value and meaning. Um, and so uh, the idea of the campus um, really is more from a standpoint to be very candid if you own 500 acres of land, what you saw today is a good taste of some top level ideas, and there's more. Um, when you own that kind of land, 
the ability or capability that you have to develop and to co-create um, streams of income like you're seeing is just, um, you know, relatively limitless. I mean, it's, you know, there's limits to everything, of course, but it just gives you far more um, breath and ability uh, to create multiple streams of income. And so I guess that's my point is not so much of getting off grid. It's, um, it's not that it's just more of um, from my background and my exposure and doing my research that I've done. I mean, my background in parts in economics as well. So when I'm looking out at things and forecasting stuff, um, I'm just recognizing as I'm reading the tea leaves, like all of you, um, they're just, there are certain things that I can see that are winding down more quickly than others. There are other places where there's going to be some, some gray space, meaning, you know, it, it could function another several years until the, you know, the lights are out on it. But the bottom line is in terms of, as Stephen mentioned, you know, I'm looking at things in a, uh, as best I can really in a 50 year window in 30 years, uh, 30 to 50 in housing. So it all depends on in industry size. Um, but the overall plan for the campus is a 50 year vision to get started. And the reason that's important is because when you talk to your donor investors or shareholders, however you want to terminology, it, you know, use terminology for it, you've got to be able to give them the right scope and the right sense of the scale of what it is that's being created. If we're trying to create a foundation and one of the pieces we're using, you know, there's three or four different means of how we want to see raise $250 million over the next 30 years. And that's not using donor funds, but it's through multiple means like walnut groves and through four or five other means that we're looking to do. Um, then I'd like to see how do we use those means to create a couple hundred million dollars in addition to funds that we might raise from other donors as well. So it's not one or the other. I think that's one of the limited factors that I hear so often, even from presidents of universities and other places where you think, you know, in more sophisticated environments, they'd think more creatively. And oftentimes they're locked into a very linear approach for different reasons. Um, but I'll leave it here for a moment. You know, as we're watching our own schools, the great concern is that if you're not aware, you should be praying because your local Christian college might need you more today than they've ever needed because so many of them are on the brink of going bankrupt in the next two years because they've been so operating so highly leveraged at a 95% tuition basis, which means if they don't have students coming through the door, they're out of business right. because their own endowments are so small. So again, it goes back to um, poor planning, poor stewardship, lack of vision, and really just not a lack of, I love this word from General McChrystal. I wrote a book called Team of Teams. If you ever get a chance to read it, it's really great. There's another book out that's called Failure of Imagination. And one of the pieces that I'll you know stop here on, but I think the piece that I've seen too often we have come short in, in largely church and in mission is there has been a failure of imagination um, to see what it is we can do. And more importantly, what are the new things, as Greg said earlier, top of the call, what are the new wineskins that God wants to do and how do we create those, um, you know, in partnership with them? And I think right now, especially these next 10 years, this is probably one of the most important, most exceptional times where we really get out in front and start paddling harder and faster than you ever have. Um, because what we're about to witness and what's going to shift is going to blow most people's minds. So if we're not working harder, faster, smarter, um, to really understand not how we work it out, not the task, but working out harder, faster, smarter to hear the voice to God, like revelation three, two says, hear what the spirit says, we need to really understand from a spiritual perspective, what is God's strategies to build and advance his kingdom and his ministries, not our little ministries, uh, because those are going to fail. Yeah, if I could um, 
add, Stephen, just a little bit uh, further commentary there on on Chris's answer to your question. Yeah, you know what? Uh, there's uh, Jonathan Frizz who left the call, but he and I have joked about how we really need to raise a land and people fund. And what we were joking about is like we always talk about in venture capital and, and capital markets, like utility of capital and money and where's your best return and how do you make an investment. But really what Chris is pointing out, I agree with, I think that uh, Christianity, especially in Western Christianity has become so money focused donor dependent, we've kind of forgotten about our inheritance and the greatest gift uh, the world has in terms of resource are people. And then the next greatest gift is land. And people plus land equals uh, uh, productivity, value, uh, resources, and um, you know, uh, uh, abundance. So under God, what can happen? We, when we make money the focus, money's like the God, then God lifts his hands away from us and says, well, I guess you've got that. You're going to pay for it with money. But if we really explore, well, what could God do with these people who we're related to and in these lands? There's, there's so much potential. That's untapped potential. And layer on top of that, all of the kingdom supernatural impact of use what you have and see what God will do in multiplying it. That's all throughout scripture. That's how the 4,000 were fed, the 5,000 were fed. What do you have? Who are the people here? Let's use that. Let's pray. Let's see what God would do and multiply. So we don't have to be dependent as a believer on the grid. We don't have to be dependent on the money, on the systems of this world. Um, some people argue all the time with me, no, you have to have money to do anything. No, no, you have to be, you know, in this world, you've got to be able to do it that way. And I just think we're selling ourselves short. We're missing the inheritance of God. What could we do as a people? And then that's going to take time and a transition. But yeah, like if we understand it, we're no different than Job or Abraham or anyone else in the biblical narrative, Noah. Um, what did they have? They didn't have U.S. dollars. They, you know, they, they had their faith. We've talked about on... Um, this discussion group before that the currency of, 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 of the, of God's economy is his favor, his love, his faith. So this, this is really what's valuable, um, if we can understand it. And so it's, it's even an educational process to try to start weaning ourselves off of it, as opposed to let's just prep for doomsday. Now I want to, I want to, uh, shift to Joel Travis. He has his hand up. Joel, are you there? I'm here, yep. Um, thank you so much, Chris. It's been really awesome to hear your thoughts and experience and even the different groups you've been in in Pasadena and now there. Um, the one thing that you've done, you've, you mentioned that it sounds super logical, but I, I would have guessed that a lot of people wouldn't think it's logical. Uh, you started about 10 organizations Sorry, I was walking on the sidewalk. You, you started about 10 there. organizations on 500 acres. Um, and so I was curious, um, it has awesome strengths because it's kind of like the best delegation possible. You have individual responsibility for each vision inside that organization. Um, but there could be, I guess even with the, we'll say the old persons or the retirement homes and the farming, potential land constraints or just like how do you share and all of that uh, with the different organizations on on the same land so how did you decide which orgs to start uh, how do you govern which orgs like if a new idea comes up this year how will you decide whether to start it or not start it um, and how do you guide that and then have you seen that strength actually manifested where by creating an org, that org gets to run very clearly and quickly with that vision and not be hindered by the administration of the other things. Like the other option, I guess, would have been only leave it as one org and it grows into this behemoth with many visions and a lot of heads at the same board table that are all fighting for different things. So I see the elegance and wanted to hear you comment on that. Um, 
I think my maybe the most simple way I can do it is uh, if you look back or did some you know thinking groups like Intel Corporation who we all are familiar with um, uh, there's there's two things I like to use with that analogy sometimes and that is um, if you look at your laptop or computer sometimes you look down and you'll see a little sticker on there and it says Intel inside and it talks about the chip that powers your computer uh, the chip in our case is really um, what is the vision and the gospel message that we're really trying to walk out it's that kingdom strategy and so that has to be clearly embedded and aligned as part of the alignment and the comprehensive integrated align. That alignment has to be in every single one of those organizations. And that's what those um, other presidents or people that I work with um, and I talk about and what those boards are responsible to execute to. And so that has to be there. Accountability has to be very clear, um, especially when you have so many different groups going in a number of directions, as you mentioned. The other part behind that is critical in Intel as a company is that um, there's a lot of examples we could do, but for brevity, um, Intel's research and development arm is a separate corporation because it has a different culture. You cannot do the level of innovation research development within, like you said, the you know the 800 pound gorilla type organization that's trying to be more systematic and streamline operations and just simply get it smoother and smoother and simpler and refine it. Um, when you're doing R&D and research innovation, especially at the leading or bleeding edge of it, if you want to give those different distinctions and elements, um, it's so messy and it's so disruptive, not from a market perspective, but from your internal operating manager level perspective. Because when you're calling the shots in a regular business, day-to-day -day operations, things are moving. When you're working in an R&D innovative environment, you're, you're calling audibles as a regular part of your playbook <laughs> because things are just, things are moving that quickly. And so you've got to have people who can work with you and can manage um, intuitively get a sense of the feel of where things are going but at the same time have an understanding of um, this is just you know part of the flow and the nature of the work that we're doing and uh, it's not that it's chaotic because it doesn't mean that it is chaotic it just means that there's a different flow so from that standpoint i just took that to heart and i realized that each of these different groups needs to thrive and if they're going to function and if they're going to grow rapidly they each need to have, they each need to be empowered with their own resources, their own leadership, their own board. But that Intel inside idea is what keeps it all kind of threaded together. Um, and so when I'm meeting with each of the different heads of those different organizations, um, I can continue to go back or call back to core strategies, key issues. Um, and if you want to talk about this offline, the other thing that you could use from a military perspective that's very important. Uh, is the difference between jointness and also what is commander's intent. And so we can talk about those principles later, but jointness and commander's intent are also two of the other principles uh, that are part and parcel of how you run larger, more complex, and widely distributed organizations uh, than most companies are designed or structured to be. Great. Thank you. That's yeah, that's great. Thanks, Joel. I'm going to turn over to Lucianne. Uh, she's got her hand raised. Lucianne, would you like to go ahead and ask Chris a question? Yes. One of the things that is most intriguing to me is the think tank. So my question is, how narrow of a group do you have in the sense of, is this really dealing with, I don't know your organization, so I'm sorry. Is this mm -hmm. mostly dealing with, um, uh, Korea and and the U.S. culture, or in so are the people there mostly your group of people thinking, or do you invite other people in to your think tank um, yeah. processing? Yo, know, thanks for asking. Um, there is a, a broad range. If you're you're probably familiar with you know different diaspora groups, and so sometimes they talk about themselves. 
or refer to their generations as a 1.0, 1.5, 2.0, 3.0 generation of you know, when they've been here in the US. So I mentioned that in part because as you start looking at the 2.0 and beyond uh, generations, whether Korean or others, um, they could be a Vietnamese, Somali, whomever, um, but of all these different groups, um, those generations have clear distinctives that separate them in a number of ways. And so we're looking more largely at that 2.0 and other generation within the Korean community, um, but it really doesn't have, it's not a cultural, in a sense, it's not uh, culturally bound. Um, one of the other gentlemen that uh, is here locally that we work with is a um, retired um, two-star general and been involved in numerous different creative ventures uh, for government over the last 25 years. And there's a whole group of people uh, in that sector. And so the way I would define it best um, in simple terms is I'm looking at multiple different expressions um, or sectors uh, within industries and finding and looking for people that uh, have not just expertise in the area, um, but have actually built and designed and developed something original in those spaces and bringing those folks um, together. So uh, that's really where I'm beginning. Um, the process of that uh, is called, I'll just leave it with you so you can talk about it later if it's of interest. Um, you know, we have a Fortune 500 group. Um, I'm just affectionately calling it our Faith 500. And so I'm looking for 500 um, would tend to be more founder type people. Um, sometimes they're CEOs, but often they're the founder CEO type person that's created the thing and looking to engage those people because they uniquely have that ability uh, and have demonstrated the resolve um, of hearing from God, overcoming the obstacles to walk it out and then actually build, develop, see it through and God willing, even pass that on to the next generation to see it uh, flourish and, and grow. So those are the kinds of folks that I'm looking to invite into that think tank environment. And that would include people who are outside of the Korean community, right? Yeah, that's, that could be anybody, yeah. Okay, thank you, Lucienne. Any, great, any follow up? Um, let's see, we had another hand raised, I believe it was Merrick. Merrick, go ahead. Thank you, Greg. Chris, just uh, so much work you're doing here. I just wonder if you're thinking outside the box with respect to, say, a currency collapse. I'm not sure that there will actually be a, a full collapse, but if we look at ancient cultures, even in Zimbabwe, when the currencies collapse, they tend to go to a barter economy. Mm -hmm. And then there's just such tremendous potential um, in terms of how God sees currency, faith, love, action, uh, mentoring, discipleship, how, how we can flush out uh, <laughs> the, the depth of the people that are with you in a barter type situation where you could reach local people in ways you may never see them before. It's part of the reason why, um, by the way, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Chris. Good to see you. Um, one of the reasons why I, I don't know God's timing in this, it's just a, a real desire uh, and burden on my heart is, you know, frankly, I would love to see a thousand of these things happening all over the place, mm. uh, all over the country, all over the world. Mm. Um, without getting into too much, but in the last few years I've been here, there's some other folks that we've got to know, become friends with, and they've got just lovely ranches, a few hundred acres, a couple thousand acres, you know, cattlemen. Mm. Uh, that are out mm -hmm. here. Um, and, you know, we've come into some agreements already where, you know, we're trading certain agriculture for uh, mm -hmm. a couple of cows. And um, nice. you know, we've got a, a whole campus here when we've got 400 uh, people who are coming, uh, they do a conference for four days, five days. And it's one thing to go out there and, you know, you can buy steaks and do dinners uh, a couple nights for people. Um, it's a whole lot different when I can get literally down the street processed organic beef um, that was three days old and serve it on campus that I know is actually organic 
And if you went to the store to buy, it'd be a pretty penny. I'm not saying it's Wagyu pricing, but it's not cheap. Mm. So the, the benefit of why I think God's wisdom in this is to develop more of these models as much and as, as maybe even as quickly as we can is because when we can do this, um, you can, I think we your question already get a sense of it. Um, there are more things we've been able to do for this community because we've been here and operated this way, you know, through COVID, let's just make it real basic and simple. Um, we started with a 3,000 acre greenhouse. I expanded it to five acres, not of greenhouse, but five acres of farming with a 3,000 square foot greenhouse. We produced, we produced so much that we started creating gift boxes and sending them around the community and, and refilling the food banks. Any, again, anyone can do this. Mm. This wasn't anything you know, that unique and special. It took a lot of hard work mm. by a few people. Mm. But mm. the point is, if one organization does that little bit and has that much effect, mm. then I'll pause here and say, this is the other side of me that gets a little agitated or I can be an agitator. Um, but with all the churches that are available and all the land that many churches have sitting next to them, mm -hmm. a lot of churches, when they bought their original land, didn't buy one acre to build a church on. They bought three, four, five, or 10. And you'd never know it because it's either growing weeds or one acre is a parking lot, one acre is a church, and you don't even know the church owns the other eight acres. You're just sitting in the back. Mm -hmm. So my point is, with all of this, what I'm witnessing from the last several years and I'll, I'll wrap this up quickly here. Sorry for the longer part, but it just burdens me. We've been selling off at fire sale prices for the last several years, over a billion. One year in 2016, it was $1.7 billion worth of church assets to real estate commercial developers. Whoa. And we've been doing it, why? Because the income has been in decreasing, because the donors have been decreasing. Well, watching, that's why I know the level of the cliff we're on is because I've been watching this for 10 years. It's only been accelerating. And the level of hard assets that used to back up the resources that could help these organizations in a swing during a lull in an economy no longer exist. They're gone. So we fire sailed our way through this. And even the IMB, which I won't get into now, but the IMB ended up selling over $200 million worth of assets and letting go close to a thousand people on their staff to keep the lights on. Again, it's, it's the, they were one of the largest and oldest mission organizations in the world. So whether you're them, whether you're Moody Bible College Institute in Chicago, which has been selling real estate to also help fund keeping things going, <clears throat> Moody has been a bellwether and a blue chip. So IMB, Moody, and a number of other groups over this last 10 years, very quietly, because who wants to actually say that you're doing it? It's not attractive. And it certainly doesn't make donors happy. But they've had to sell hard assets to keep things going. So the very reason why I think God is impressing mm -hmm. on us right now to think more creatively and to mm -hmm. find other ways of generating income is because when we do that, we get more connected to our local community. We, in, we right. build up the local economy. We become mm -hmm. one thing which people in society have said church is no longer, which is relevant. And so we become very relevant to our local communities because we're serving them in the most mm -hmm. meaningful ways mm -hmm. um, and helping them where they need it most. If you mm -hmm. look at Matthew 25, 40, it's when did you see me naked? When did you see me hungry? When was, you know, when was I this or that? It's, we've got to even do the very basic things to share and to demonstrate that we actually do love and care for our neighbor. And sadly, we have not done that for the better part of the last hundred years in North America. So it's no reason for me, and I'm not surprised one iota, why the world looks at us and says, are you relevant? Are you relevant? Thank you, Chris, for that uh, comprehensive uh, uh, expression of just being local, being mindful of
how to do things, not just globally, but very locally. It's, thanks for the wisdom on that. That was great. Hey, everyone. It's uh, 10 o'clock. Um, we usually have the call through to 930. Um, we can take one more question, maybe, if anyone has it. Otherwise, we can close in prayer. I see Joel uh, and, jo and Jonathan in Texas are both on, but we haven't heard from them. I don't know if you guys want to ask Chris a question or have any comments, um, JJ or anyone else. Okay, well, um, if not, Let's wrap this up and maybe uh, Steve Reedy, would you close us in prayer today? Thank you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for uh, unfolding an amazing plan and tapping um, very gifted people who are in alignment with your heart and your and your and have the mind of Christ. And you've given them a super large vision. And you've given them capacity. And you've given them connection. And you've given them coordination. And you've given them so many things, even at this stage. Lord, we want to thank you for your plans as they're unfolding. And we ask that you would release blessing after blessing with how to implement and execute the vision, this grand vision that you've given, and that you would sustain the leaders that you've selected. We ask that your leadership anointing upon Chris would mm. continue to expand and that he would never find that he's moving in his own strength. Lord, we thank you that you've given him a vision that's engaged with culture and that is not uh, utopian in, in nature because we know that those go sour quickly. An internalized church is what you've been bringing to our attention. Um, so we thank you that this is a kingdom expression of in the world and not of it. Mm. We ask your we ask generational blessing upon leadership and the vision. Thank you for what was shared today. May it be impartation and inspiration to all those who have heard, and may there be multiplication for even what was shared today. Mm. Lord, create in us a new mind and a new heart where we can get out of yesterday's paradigms for the church in its relationship to the culture and how we see kingdom. Lord, give us kingdom vision. Mm -hmm. Let us get out of old wineskin thinking and get into your kingdom thinking. Yes. So Lord, we thank you for what, what's been happening and how you use the connections from history uh, between Korea and America. Uh, and mission and business and how it's all working together. Well, we thank you for bringing all things together, even through this expression. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Holy Spirit. We thank you, Father. Amen. 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 Hey, I want to thank Chris. Chris, buddy, I really appreciate your time you're taking here and your commitment to what you guys are doing. And uh, just love you and appreciate your friendship. Um, and uh, just a rich time today in this Q&A and your presentation, so thank you. Um, we're thinking about moving this meeting to 10 o'clock. Those who are still here are probably the wrong people to ask, but um, is there anybody here who could not make it 10 o'clock? We're doing this uh, to try to give some more space to people out on the West Coast and the mountain time and so forth. This is the idea of the thought. Um, anybody here? I can't make it 10 o'clock. Uh, school starts in September. I most likely will not be able to make it 10 o'clock. Okay, that's good to know. What time uh, works for you when school, up to what time works for you, JJ, when school starts? They, they told us uh, 9 o'clock start this year. 
So we're starting a little later than usual. Usually we start at 7.38, but we're doing a nine o'clock start now. Okay, and great. I don't know if I teach a first period, so that might even be from, I might even be able to go till 10 o'clock or something, so. Okay, thank you for the feedback. Um, appreciate everybody here. Good uh, having you guys on the call together. And uh, thank you, Jesus, for all these things. We'll see you next time. Have a great day. Great week, guys. God bless.